All right, everybody, welcome. Round seven, Half Dead Musings podcast. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> yep. All right, it's going to be a good night. And uh, I have a bunch of awesome topics tonight. This one's going to be uh, good, definitely good focused. night. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm Brian, run the Dead Man uh, Dreams channel, and this is. Of course, I'm Marco from Musings by Marco. Yeah, if you've seen our earlier ones, I'm sure you're familiar, but hopefully we're bringing in a new audience as well. So I have a ton of cool World War One things we're going to go over. We're going to talk about... Um, Oliver Stone's views on Russia, Sri Lanka, and how they're having a collapse of their entire economy and country basically right now. But I figure we'll just jump into one of the craziest stories from World War One because World yeah, War One. And I'll make sure we end up talking about Elon Musk, Tesla, <laughs> and other whatever random thing crosses my mind uh, while we go through it. Sounds good. And we purposely uh, dressed the same just for fun. Why not? Yeah, this is the day go tea night. And I got I'm rocking the uh, Memento Mori. Uh, pendant as well. I had to get the little hand off the screen here. All right. So this is memento atheisto. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in uh, World War One was by far the most suffering for the average soldier of any war in history because it lasted years and you're in the same trenches for years and uh, oh yeah that sucks so, big time oh it's horrible and uh, in one of our earlier podcasts uh, we were talking about this a little bit and then you were like well why didn't they just dig more in order to bury the bodies more into the trenches away from where they were and the reason why mm -hmm. is because it was so dangerous just to pop your head up where are you going to scoop if you scoop the dirt out where are you going to put it you got to put it out of the trench and it was so dangerous to even stick your head up for like a, a second or two where bullets were flying thousands and thousands of artillery shells are flying you have uh, mud and dirt and everything and get this they had no idea how dangerous things were they had cloth helmets for the majority of the early portions of the war for like years cloth helmets that's just for the sun it's not stopping anything for sure yeah can't they maybe the german side was better engineered with no, german engineering at first they mean. were not but then you take the shovel, right, and then you scoop out the, the <laughs> ground, and then you put the shovel, like you do it behind you, yeah, and you over. flip up, you do it over your back, right? The, the issue uh, is if you make scale. a ramp, you make a ramp, <laughs> and then so it's like a, de it's a decline, and then you don't have to, you just go up to the top of your head, and then you're like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I can well, see people lazy and they're just like they stick there. I would be like, make sure my head's below the line. We'll get that. And then the next guy next to me would stick up his head and like a bullet would go through his forehead. These guys would have that dysentery with like chronic diarrhea and stuff, and there was not even yeah. enough space for them to use the bathroom in these trenches. And so these guys would wait to the very last minute to when their guts were about to burst. They felt to risk their lives to run into a artillery shell, the hole that they were using as a toilet, and they would risk their lives only at the last minute after tremendous suffering it was so messed up but the reason why that doesn't go out into death thing. to take a shit that is a tough that's a yeah. tough yeah, so, yeah. To be a, <laughs> a bad do you want to go yeah and uh i'll just shit my pants that's the thing <laughs> right, what's to stop you from shitting on the ground next to you is like well, you're uh, living uh, with a people an officer thousands. gonna shoot you no yeah. there's thousands and thousands of people who are living in yeah, not squalor. everyone can do it yeah i mean, I mean this what i was about to say is the scale is so much beyond our comprehension of what we can even imagine you're talking if you look at a, a football stadium filled with people that's nothing we're talking yeah. like hundreds of thousands of troops along hundreds and hundreds of miles of uh, uh trenches like 450 miles worth of trenches uh from i think it was the french side alone and so the scale is so much like, tens of thousands are dead yeah. right i guess it goes to why logistics are so important in any war it's uh, and the Germans, you know, really. you gotta get uh, your supplies and you gotta get your shit taken away. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's some, uh, if you're in a trench. Luckily, there's no that's not a thing anymore. Trench warfare, yeah. I don't think, is much of a thing. It's much more mobile. And uh, also, like they are fighting for lines right now in Ukraine. I heard um, mm -hmm. like uh, there's some intense fighting, but it's like dying down, and they're gonna kind of set up lines where they feel more comfortable to set up their long range weapons weapons and then kind of just slowly yeah. wear each other down with long-range stuff yep artillery that's how it was in world war one as well then after the oh, get this in the battle of verdun alone 
There was 10 million artillery shots from the French alone, and the Germans were the ones who started it because they were Verdun. You know, ching France. for if you're a weapons company. I mean, <laughs> it's like every time that it's thing. True. Remember Lord of War? It's like yeah. you show the AK-47 in slow motion, and it yeah. puts in cash register sounds and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like other people see better than war and bullets. I see dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yes, yes, keep shooting, keep shooting. So the reason why the Battle of Verdun happened is yeah, the Germans lot. were trying to lure the, uh, the French into an area where they would just be slaughtered like a meat grinder, they call it. Uh, uh -huh. where Verdun was there something was, about the terrain that was uh, advantageous no, no. It, or just because they have superior forces Verdun set up there ahead of time? Or? It was a very important mm. city and there was a hill nearby and uh, mm. so the Germans... Did they have the high ground? Yeah, if the Germans were threatening the city, it, it was a very important city to the French. So if the French try to stop the Germans in that situation. The Germans had the idea that they would just mow down and blow up all the French soldiers and win that battle. If the French stand down, they take over this uh, very important city of the French. So it was like a lose-lose. That's a way to force a conflict. Yeah, basically. So they, uh, it, they, so they have to come in to a uh, area where they have the advantage, and if they don't come in, then they're sat, they're uh, giving up this important city. Yes, exactly. That's smart. Yeah, yeah it was a brilliant strategy move. Uh, but all right, here's a we're gonna do one little story at a time, World War One style, and then we're gonna okay. switch up the topics. I could also I like to recommend this movie I saw recently called Operation Mincemeat. Uh, have you heard of that? No, that I'm not good. sure. Yeah, it's with uh, that British guy. Is really good. Uh, he was in the King's Speech, and it's basically about a um, the World War II uh, mission where uh, it was one of the early landings, I think, before D Day, where the Allies had to make a big landing in Sicily to uh, establish a beachhead onto kind of the mainland uh, Europe. And uh, Hitler, it was knew that they wanted to land in Sicily, so he had all his forces concentrated there waiting for them and if they were to go there they would have had huge losses and they might have lost the war mm -hmm. so they created this they want they were coming up with ways to try to trick him to believe that we're going to attack greece instead <laughs> and the I, but the point but the trick is how to really convince him they came up with the idea to use a body and have papers on it uh, that talked mm -hmm. about the uh, yeah. that plan, that, that's and they let the body be discovered. Yeah, they let the body put in a place where it's likely to be discovered. I yeah. think in Spain. Uh, that was a real story. And yeah, yeah, and uh, they that's are misleading. hoping the Spanish were corrupt enough to give up that to the Brit to the Germans, and then the Germans did find it. And then there was a guy on the German side where there was rumblings that the intelligence leader of Germany didn't like Hitler and were trying to form a way to get rid of him. So there were rumors that were never substantiated that maybe he found out, even though it was false, it was hmm. credible enough where he wanted to push it to force them to lose the war. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it threw in a good love story as well, along <laughs> with a lot of uh, yeah. But it was a good one, and that guy is like he's like one of the king's romantic comedies. Uh, this guy, mm -hmm. you know, he's like classy, like Hugh Grant and him were like the classy like <laughs> rom like romantic love movies. And then uh, and all the stuff uh, about what went into the uh, the operation and the thinking and all that was pretty entertaining as well. Cool. But uh, yeah, so all right, uh, so that's out now. Nice. So back about, Verdun. about this Verdun thing, uh, there was a bunch of giant fortresses uh, of the French that was guarding their city, and uh, this is one of the craziest stories you'll ever hear in war. There's uh, Germ the Germans were trying to invade, of course, to take over the fortresses in, or in order to you know force the French into a battle, but they didn't want to take everything too much. But anyways, the, uh, there was a ton of German troops, and they were uh, going after this fortress. An artillery shells blast somehow launched a German soldier but didn't even injure him that bad. He got launched into the fortress at the top 
and then he starts wandering around the hallways of the fortress and with his pistol alone and then he, he, he was going room by room he, uh -huh. opens, he opens one door and it's a bunch of French uh, French soldiers playing oh, cards shit. they're playing Long cards door. just hanging out yeah. and they're like <laughs> yeah. he, he uh, took them all hostages and then locked them in a room moved on to the <laughs> took next them hostages come yeah. on guys well no that's come the cool on. part throw up the this. table he yeah. went room by room and he kept taking hostage after hostage because nobody really SWAT SWAT style yeah so he took over the whole fortress by himself basically after capturing hostage me. room after hostage room not a, a shot was fired not a person was injured and uh, I need to make a movie about that yeah that was just that little sequence alone would be so great to yeah. watch and so I got a crap ton of good stuff but I know Elon Musk uh, that was just a, a taste of it we got a crap ton more coming of uh, cool World War One stuff so I know Elon Musk has had a lot of crazy tweets and controversy and this sexual scandal and ripping on Democrats saying he's now a Republican and all that stuff so you just do it you, you know more <laughs> yeah than, I'm sure uh yeah yeah I've been following this a bit the target's definitely on him now <laughs> He hasn't been doing himself any favors lately. It's definitely uh, been making himself an easier target. Yeah. And I don't know why he has to, you know, put himself in this position. It doesn't seem necessary to say all that stuff, but he just seems to really want to say what he's thinking. Um, yeah. He thinks it's important for some reason. But, uh, um,. And I don't think it's fair to say, you know, he's going to vote Republican no matter what. He doesn't even know he's going to run. I thought he declared Republican. He just said he was a Republican in the tweets or whatever. He just well, he said he, he always voted. Uh, he always considered himself an independent. And, and like uh, left-centrist, I thought. Like, left-centrist. Well, uh, just... Um, the, he saw the Democratic Party as the party of kindness, is how he put it, and uh, so he ended up um, he ended up uh, voting for Democratic presidents in the past, but um, through a combination of uh, I'm sure Biden is big in the pockets of the unions, and as a result, uh, they've been it's been really obvious that they've been giving the cold shoulder to Tesla. Um, you know, they had a summit where they invited every other automaker but Tesla to an EV summit. Who did that? Tesla. The Biden administration. Oh, Biden did that? I didn't even know that. Oh, yeah. That was pretty big. Um, yeah, uh, GM, them. They, they invited everyone. You know, yet Tesla is making, is made in America, is more made in America than, you know, Ford is making their uh, the, their EVs in Mexico. Yeah. Um, just a little bit of final assembly. Tesla is the leader and, by far still, right? As far as electric. Oh, vehicles. yeah. Yeah. Uh, the 70% of the electric vehicles sold in America the last 2021 were Teslas. 70%. Good. And, uh, and California is kind of the leader in the car market. And uh, the Model 3 and the Model Y are the two best-selling cars out of any car in California for the last year. Nice. Which is, I mean, and right after that are much cheaper cars. Then you have the Toyota Camry and the Honda Civic, mm -hmm. which cost like... Ten to twenty thousand dollars less on average. So Jeez. you know, people are really stretching to buy these these Teslas. So they got snubbed there. I get uh, they got. He's always been snubbed in uh, speeches. Um, uh, it's just really obvious that the, the United Auto, uh, Auto UAW uh, union is a big influence, and they give a lot of money to the Democratic Party. Hmm. And it's apparently, especially to Biden, to get get elected. So. You know, it's just this really obvious where he has to cater to them because of that. And he's, he's, he tells them they're the leaders, tells GM, you're the leader. You started all of this. You led, you know, you led Mary that whole meeting. A friend meme. of mine is investing in GM, actually, uh, and I was telling him the AI alone and the Tesla robot, once that kicks off, it's more game-changing than anything GM can pull out. Yeah, they just don't have the roadmap to uh, for a total addressable market. Uh, they're not. They're struggling to get where Tesla there is now, and I don't think they're even going to be able to get there. Just yeah. on just the hardcore manufacturing of cars, of electric cars, not to mention all the the software and the robots, and the autonomy. Mm -hmm. They do have 
a uh, startup that they bought who is pretty good with self-driving stuff and they do have some good demos going in certain cities so like there is an argument to be made on that alone if they are uh, if that works that they are at such a low like multiple such a low um valuing right now it's kind of seems cheap uh, but you know, um, there's still there's a chance they go out of business. Honestly, with how far they are behind, but uh, they have GM? a lot of ties to the government. Yeah, really. Uh, I mean, but they got regular cars they're making, not just electric. But no one's gonna want those anymore. Hmm. I see. If you can't sell those, no one wants to buy those, then that's well, a big problem. And they're going to have to tr transition 100% to electric. And then, yeah, they're still making, like you said, they're making gas cars. So how are they able to stay profitable while they kill the most profitable part of their business? And they're stuck with all these legacy, like the, the union slows things down, although it's, it is good, but it make, can make it harder to change things quickly because uh, it's more about preserving what you yeah, got. Yeah, exactly. It's always... The stagnation. I was going to say it saves a lot of people. It improves a lot of people's lives. So it's not like I could be say that we should get rid of unions. But in like let's say something that is uh, like Tesla, where it's going to accelerate, you know, a lot of benefits for a lot of people. It doesn't seem like a good idea as long as the benefits package that their average worker gets is still good and it is really competitive and still really good, especially with the stocks well, that their employees a, get. GM uh, union workers don't even get stuck. How long uh, is it going to take to transition to electric vehicles? It seems like it's going to be a pretty long, drawn-out process, maybe over it's like dependent. 30 years. It's dependent. I think maybe. it'll be fa No way. It's faster than you think. See, a lot of people are thinking that way. Uh, I uh, There's good evidence, good data, that uh, we're going to sell more electric vehicles than gas vehicles hmm. by uh, 2027. Or 2026 is getting moved up. What Elon wants 2026. is those, uh, tax, uh, the tax carbon more, so that way it forces people into electric vehicles more. If that happens, it'll accelerate it, I imagine. Well, yeah, just to, to realize the real cost of uh, carbon, because right now the cost is in the worse climate that we're all going to have to deal with, which will have a high cost to everyone. Mm -hmm. And so if you actually just put in that cost up front, instead of it being put in the atmosphere where it causes irreversible problems, yeah, you put that cost up front, now it's like an investment. You like got a 10 to 1 return by preventing, by adding an extra dollar, you prevent $10 or maybe yeah. even $100 of damage per dollar is that of guaranteed? all our crops failing well, and you know, water it level dumbest, rising. It was the dumbest science ex uh, experiment of uh, all time by pumping fossil fuels into the atmosphere but it's an experiment is it really guaranteed that that's what's going to happen given that we've had climate change over you know the entire history of the earth and there's there are no guarantees in science there's no guarantees yeah. in reality but there is overwhelming evidence there's overwhelming agreement by every expert when you get to the 95 yeah. percent level and then he's in science it might as well be a guarantee it's then, like, see, Obama, what that means is that's the thing you have to plan for it's yeah. It's uh, at that point you don't say, well, there's a small chance it's not true. It's like, well, then you're going to really shoot yourself in the foot. So at that well, point you want to plan that's for the that. Thing though, because when I see Democrat politicians, I believe I heard Obama got an oceanfront mansion, and you got beat these guys. If 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 you're really that concerned over climate change, and you're a Democrat where they're overwhelmingly for climate change, why are you getting these waterfront properties that are likely going to be worthless if climate change is actually real, like? in the next well it depends on your time scale yeah i think by the time he dies it'll still be valuable um but uh hey uh you know he could uh could be wrong he could be making a bad investment decision that's possible too True. um just because he is uh, was the the president and he got it was the know a lot of things mm -hmm. could be making a mistake there but uh it, a lot of it depends on your elevation you can get like uh beachfront but if you're high enough uh 
to, um, you know, if you're right at water level, if you're like Florida, a lot of stuff is right at water level. Yeah. Uh, that could be big problems. But if the area around you especially is high, much higher than water level and it's just you have a slope that goes down to the beach, then you're still fine. But, uh, you know, you have to account for much higher storm surges because that's going to come be before total water level rise is mm -hmm. every storm that happens is going to allow the water as they become worse to reach higher and higher and overwhelm the local infrastructure to deal with standing water and flooding and things like that there was that a, could cause a lot of property damage there was a neighborhood uh, in alone. florida i was going to say that i saw some years back without storms or anything like that the water level rose so much that their entire street it was flooded like almost all the time now and mm -hmm. all the people had to move out of there and a yeah. lot of money was wasted uh but for those who live there and, where was this uh, it was a uh, i forget which part of florida but it was in florida, florida. somewhere yeah, yeah. A near a city it was near a big city as well it uh, doesn't take much for some of these areas if they're close to water level mm -hmm. like it's a it's um if you get into more into real estate and you learn about grading and how like certain uh, properties, for example, they don't have proper gutters put in the ground to get away water. Uh, you can have standing water problems quite easily and that can lead to a lot of damage to your house. Oh yeah. Um, it oh, doesn't yeah. take, yeah, but just because you know, when rain uh, and, you know, if any body of water comes by, it's just such massive amounts of water yeah. <laughs> that uh, it's, if you're just an inch where it sits right on you instead of moving on to where it should be, it will be a big trail to sit there and it'll be a big problem for True. you. Yeah, so that's it really doesn't thinking. take much. Wasn't there a stand-up comic like Bill Hicks or something that uh, was saying, well, <laughs> these people get houses right next to river uh, floodplains and they're like, oh no, poor me. Why is this happening to me? And then they, it happens over and over yeah. again and they don't do anything about it. <laughs> like every, yeah. every year, like, I mean, you got to figure the reality is, yeah, people don't, a lot of people don't do their homework, and uh, then other people uh, are just, you know, momentum, they're just like, I've, you know, I don't want to change, I fear change. <laughs> Yeah. And it's like, this is my, this is what life is. Every year, every couple of years, we get fucked over by a storm and it destroys everything. And uh, that's just our life. We rebuild <laughs> and that's, they, they're like, they accept it. You know, that's what it is. That's you why know, it's like you can you condition people to be used to such shitty situations. That's one of the downfalls of humanity is we're so adaptable, which is such a good thing, yeah. but we're also adaptable to really shitty conditions yeah. where if you get people used to them, then they'll just accept it and be taken advantage advantage of yeah i was gonna say there was a guy who worked for vice news he was he heard when he was like in his early 20s that there's rumors of this rare dinosaur type creature living deep in the jungles of con of the congo so <laughs> yeah and so this guy went there because oh, it was, really it's so remote <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's so remote though that it was plausible and if you never girl if you talk to the people in the congo they actually believe it and they say most of them what are those bronchosaurus those uh, the real long necked uh, tree eating ones like kind of like the Loch Ness monster looking uh, the one yeah I think you got a brontosaurus uh, yeah. yeah it's supposed to be a version of one of those and so this guy look like, at them like big cows pretty much but uh he went over there and when he was on the hunt for this dinosaur he saw these french like uh giant mansions built in the jungle and uh like these like legit old old school style uh european yeah style home because there. uh they were they had cheap slave labor there so they came in with the superior weaponry and they had all the locals doing all their work for them and they're exporting things super no, cheap they had were, so much money they built these giant french mansions no, no, they it was, like it was after like sla the slavery and colonialism. I don't even. Oh know yeah. Well, that's why right. those got built, though. That's no, why no. Those got it, built. These were more modern guys who moved there because it was dirt cheap, and they tried building these mansions. And then, uh, it, it, no matter how much they tried to keep the the weeds and the plants of the jungle out from the houses, it was impossible. That's a lot of work. Yeah. It was impossible for them to live. Well, there. that's because they, so they didn't have a hundred. 
to a hundred slaves. <laughs> How do you know? I because think it they was did. modern That's mansions like ten years ago. They were just built. It wasn't no slavery times. I'm saying oh. these, these were recently built uh, places, and the and he met. Uh, he even I think he said he met one or two of the owners, and so they tried to just live a lavish life in the jungle, but the jungle consumed their houses, and they were forced to leave. No matter how many people they were, you were paying for dirt cheap to get rid Haven't of. Haven't they heard of power tools? I don't know why. I, I, <laughs> I mean, nowadays you have, so you have all solar panels Maybe and you have cool. batteries and you have all electric power tools. You get a couple people, you know, with some weed whacker. You get one of those nice <laughs> things you could sit on, you know, with like a lot of horsepower. It's kind of remote through everything, you know. <laughs> Not all the trees around you. Like you could just, or get a flamethrower. You know, just torch <laughs> all the land, and then you can see, yeah, or not a flamethrower, <laughs> and then you can su and you could salt the land. You get a bunch of salt. That's cheap. You put salt, it'll kill the that's land. Smart. Nothing will grow. You know, yeah, what was wrong with these people? They have a mansion and they can't fucking <laughs> get me in there. I'll, I'll make that I agree. Place work. I think we would have made it work, but uh, people <laughs> suck. So. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, we have fresh mention. <clears throat> oh, about that journey into the Congo. Uh, this guy, in his original journey, he met some uh, sex tourist guy who was there just to like bang as many. Oh yeah. As he, could. He, he didn't give his name up. <laughs> but they, they, they wandered into the jungle aimlessly with no guides or nothing. It, oh yeah, sex times in the jungle. No, no, there was no women with them. It was just these two morons <laughs> wandering into the jungle with no guidance whatsoever. They got lost well, they immediately. Each other. They got lost immediately. <laughs> though and uh what happened was <laughs> fuck each other <laughs> you don't say all right but yeah they, i'm pretty sure they sexy each other. but this this sex <laughs> course guy was treating the other guy the main <laughs> journalist from vice like 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 garbage and uh they got lost together and then they had a very <laughs> they had very few uh food reserves and uh oh, cannibalism incoming well the, the sex tourist guy was he would sneak and eat all the food and leave the asian uh, vice guy yeah. you could listen to this interview for yourself he did it on i think joe rogan you could go and watch of course, it. fucking sex tourist is gonna have no morality exactly uh, he was just like, He's like a scumbag. <laughs> and so, i was scumbag you and then know he was, it he was, you signed up for this he was ordering the other guy who was asian around like he was his slave in a sense and then they were lost they had no food they didn't know oh, what was it's not gonna turn out well they didn't know what was poisonous and so the asian hands. guy hit him in the back of the head with a rock one day the, the story's getting there you read the story uh, pretty soon uh, it's, maybe <laughs> human maybe not nature yet. it's always the same every story yeah but so they were running out of food this guy was being a jerk and then they were in a tent together and then the asian uh vice uh journalist uh vice news journalist that is uh he found a giant boulder and he was holding this boulder over the guy's head as he was sleeping just ready to smash his brains in and leave like nothing yeah. happened uh, because he knew he was in the middle of nowhere and there was no witnesses yeah. and then he had a, a moment of conscience and he decided not to do it and then he these two guys eventually were wandering what if through people the find out yeah <laughs> maybe that i don't know or he just couldn't live with himself i think he's what he said uh, so they were wandering through the forest again the jungle i mean and uh he just, I mean, he just up. leave that's probably a better option he, he glanced up and i think they were called pygmies pygmies something like that is the name for the local uh congo people over there and he looked uh, up into a tree and then they were uh, hanging in the trees one of them was up there they climbed trees <laughs> for food and for all sorts of stuff these guys climb huh. trees like absolute pros it's crazy like how monkeys. much the human yeah but like it's like crazy how much the human body can you know adapt depending on your circumstance you get calluses yeah. on your feet you could step on thorns and not be hurt stuff like yeah that. you ever seen people that have no arms and they use their feet for everything uh, they use their yeah. feet for uh eating they pick up spoons feed themselves you know yeah. brush their teeth yeah and uh so anyways this this pygmy guy was in uh in the tree and then they looked at him and i think they waved at him or whatever and then the guy came down he tried giving them food but it tasted like garbage so they rejected it even though they were starving and mm -hmm. uh then the pygmy guy led them to the uh, back to the village and it turns out they weren't even that far from where they started and they were just going <laughs> in circles trying to figure out their way out and uh uh, yeah, they just nice. uh, were complete morons wandering through the jungle, and it's one of the crazy. That's your stories. average Vice News correspondent. <laughs> Vice used to be cool. They just get like young kids who are like up for like anything, kind of dumb, but like kind of adventurous. 
and the early uh, days. they're willing to go into crazy shit and now they're just like looking. a lot of stories are like they're like willing to do drugs and stuff or they're into drugs and stuff yeah, too. Now yeah just like war junkies liberal. like drug junkies <laughs> like it's like i go into the jungle and try you know this uh local hallucinogenic plant you know <laughs> to hang out with them like that's a story yeah. another story is like i just go into the worst fighting in this country and you know <laughs> uh, i'm scared for my my life oh, and explosions are everywhere. That, I forgot to mention when that guy, the vice reporter, before he worked for Vice, this was his uh, initial trip. Uh, it turns out when he arrived in Congo, it was a civil war, and they're like, "What the hell are you doing here?" They're in, it's literally civil war time. Oops. This guy arrives and he's going searching for a dinosaur in the middle of the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mind me, stupid white man looking for a dinosaur. No, he's not white. He was he's Asian. Yeah. Oh, he's, stupid he's, he's Asian cool. man looking for a dinosaur. I, I'd love to meet the guy. I forget his name, but yeah, he's cool. And uh, so, yeah, so then Vice paid him to go back there years later. And then as he, he was there, he, he goes to this pygmy uh, village. But, well, yeah, they have to after that entertaining story he provided them yeah, for exactly. the first time. So, See, you remember it. Oh, it's <laughs> one of the most memorable stories of all time. <laughs> they're starving in the jungle. Think they're going to die. He's about to kill a man. And some guy in a tree saves them. <laughs> It's, nice. it's uh, just a Tuesday in half of the world. But get this, when he goes back for the Vice documentary, he sets up a camera in his room, and you got like three naked pygmy girls twerking. They know how to twerk, even over <laughs> there, twerking behind him naked, <laughs> they and they're blowing it, it out. I swear to you, this is this is real. <laughs> and yeah. uh, so then they try going for $2 each. Or, <laughs> they they tried going to the uh, for the dinosaur again, and then they got to a certain point, and they realized uh, it, you have to go through this like thick swamp like uh, terrain to get to where this lake is. And if you go through the swamp terrain, you got these bacteria or some kind of parasites that go into your uh, wee wee hole, urethra, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. I don't want to get too urethra. Yeah. So and then uh, these things go inside of you, and then you, they make you bleed out from every orifice of your body, your eyes, your nice. ears, everything. And so it's basically died. dick Ebola. <laughs> but whatever it is. <laughs> whatever it is. And uh, mm -hmm. so then he decided, nah, that's good enough for me. I'm not going any further. And it was like a, the Vice documentary is like a disappointment overall in the end. Uh, then the, the villagers what about say, such yeah. a good story if he pulled that out of every hole and died? <laughs> <laughs> horrible ending for him why yeah, did you uh, deprive of deprive us of this oh we gotta get into Rasputin from but the dinosaur the dinosaur now we'll never know it's there still yeah, they're, the locals all say that it's there, and they even have... But there's got to be at least two, otherwise how do they reproduce? There's got to be two dinosaurs. But, but or is it uh, asexual? Is it uh, mitosis? <laughs> <laughs> like Cartman's mom. Like Cartman's, a blob. In, in South Park, Cartman's mom is also the dad, and she's like impregnating <laughs> herself. <laughs> And like somehow like that was a part of the plot. <laughs> That's why South Park. You're impregnating yourself again, man. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, honey, I just have to impregnate uh. myself. <laughs> All right, here's some Lord. cheesy poofs. <laughs> the early, good boy now. early South Park with them cheesy poofs. They abandoned those years ago, and also Kenny uh, getting killed every time. But uh, uh, what? Yeah. No wonder. It's, he only. I, that's all I know. He dies only occasionally now. But uh, at the end of the uh, story, <laughs> it though, was like, yeah. I can see how it get a little with, tedious with this vice thing. He. Uh, he wound up in a village, and the villagers are like, "Yeah, we'll take you. We'll take you to go see the dinosaur." Then they're hanging out, and uh, they gave him some kind of a drug or something, just like what you said. <laughs> and, and then uh, they were hanging out. Then That's I don't know where... how they get new tourists in to find the dinosaur. They bring them. They say, "Yeah, pay us. We'll take you to the dinosaur." Then they give you some drugs once they take you into the middle of the jungle. <laughs> Hopefully, then you see there's some guy out there with some picture of a dinosaur it runs by while you're really high, and then he, hopefully, like picture. you believe that you saw a dinosaur well, no, th and that then they the said you back time. and it's a good experience you read the story again the human nature because the final part of the story is <laughs> two for two baby Woo! <laughs> The final part of this is uh, one of the villagers like comes out dressed like in some weird outfit, that gets, like, somewhat like a dinosaur. He's like, hopping around and doing some weird ritual. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's how they make money. That's their business. It there it was pretty remote where they were though, so it was like a ritual for the local like villager tradition. So ritual making that money. <laughs> yeah, that's the new ritual. <laughs> Take advantage of the stupid foreigner. Yes. Oh, I, I got. We have some... two more money than cents. All right, let, let's switch it up. Well, uh, I could continue uh, my uh, original story about the Elon and the, right. the, uh, the story on Twitter. Was uh, the story is um, was released by Business Insider, which originally was called Business Insider Trading. They dropped the trading parts. Now it's just Business Insider. That sounds better than Insider Trading, which is illegal. (laughs) But uh, the owners are still people who have been convicted of Insider Trading on multiple occasions and uh, numerous other frauds. So they're convicted felons known for nefarious behavior. And uh, it's not surprising that they uh, put out a hit piece. Um, the, by the way, the day before that story broke, at the uh, if you look at options uh, flow in the stock market at the end of the day, there were a ton of uh, put buying, which is basically means you're buying these um, very risky short-term gambles that the price of Tesla would drop. And that was done at the end of the market day. Wow. And the next morning, that story breaks from Business Insider Sorry, about uh, this uh, sex scandal. And Tesla drops 10% the next day. Brutal. And suddenly, all these put options that were way out of the money and unlikely to make any money were all way in the money. And they made um, millions upon millions of dollars in one day. And it's a very old story on Wall Street. You, uh, you manufacture a negative piece about a company. Company. You uh, you can either buy put options or short the stock, which uh, uh, is a way even more forceful way of pushing the price down. And um, then you release the article and you profit, uh, you know, uh, millions of dollars uh, uh, in one day. So that happened. Uh, so that's most of the Business Insider thing explained. Um, I heard, Some uh, component of it could be that they were maybe also reached out to someone who uh, maybe uh, is looking for ammunition against them right now, uh, but mostly they made money off of it. That explains most things, as we know. Yeah, I heard uh, on Fox News, uh, Fox Business, that Elon Musk's tweets <laughs> all... Fox Business, the slightly less fo- crazy Fox News. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Elon's tweets have to be approved Fox by the... Business, occasionally we say true things <laughs> occasionally we make sense fox business <laughs> but wait have you heard about elon's tweets all have to be approved by was it the sec i think that's what they said and I was yeah, like, that's not going on yeah that's what he was forced to agree to that uh, either it's a lawyer or someone was looking over elon's tweets that's obviously not been happening that would be impractical <laughs> he would only be able to tweet like once a month if that was the case like yeah, yeah. Uh, he's probably got lawyers sitting next to him while he's on the shitter you know po- tweeting about taking a shit he, and the lawyer standing next to him he's like, yeah they can't it prove it <laughs> yeah Elon so hilarious. he's saying basically like you know this is a ridiculous thing and that's limiting my free speech and and he was forced to do that because at the time that they were going to investigate him tesla was hard up for cash and um basically people who he was looking to bankers and whatnot who were going to give them the cash said we don't want to deal with this negativity at the time if this if you don't settle this investigation we won't finance you and uh you know basically tesla goes bankrupt then so hmm. as he put it it was like uh what would you do if someone was pointing a gun at your child yeah i, I yeah i saw that yeah right so and you so he to... so he yeah so uh even yeah. though it has a bunch of shitty terms to it he agreed to it which is all over you know which wasn't even that big a deal compared to what happens on wall street all the time like it's this nuts. business insider shit all this short selling shit on the other side which is less obvious him saying funding is secure at you know 69420 or whatever the fuck he says which sounds like a joke anyways yeah. because of the numbers and uh, you know what's hilarious you know and when he said that there was real interest from the Saudi uh, like fund which does 
have enough money at the time could have bought out Tesla and oh my god would they have made a great return and that same Saudi company they went on and they bought Lucid which is the really overpriced uh, with the sleazy British sales guy CEO mm. electric car company that's out right now they did a SPAC which is like that shitty scammy IPO mm. that was happening last year when money was easy and they like you know went up like four or five times and a bunch of people lost a lot of money because they're like 90 percent down like from their highs it's you know it's those they're like pump and dumps interesting i was gonna say uh my comedy script i finished it tonight uh i just gotta tweak it a little bit more but uh the good news is oh. is it's done and it, the funny thing is is the date that i started writing the actual script was 420 not even joking uh -huh. so i have it late this year four, so it only yeah. took you a month well i, so I you write outline. pretty quick then well, no 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 I, I, for the past do you find writing difficult yes i, I do. find writing very difficult well, i'm a, a heavy I, procrastinator yeah you know I, I find video editing very easy it's like it's very easy to sit down and make progress no matter what but anyways the reason i made the script so fast is because for the oh, past no, but six, about writing text writing text though that's yeah, that's, what, that's what a lot of that is right well for the past six months though it, i've been writing down everything that makes uh, me laugh and so i the script that i put together was like a combination of everything that makes me laugh combined with a narrative and you have to think about things like uh how are you going to introduce this character's name without being like hello i'm john hey how are you uh, Whatever your name is, whatever you know That's what I mean. Pretty good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so you gotta make it like not obvious. There. you gotta make it like not obvious and so for that reason that that little tiny details you don't normally have to think about is is very important and so yeah i got it done it's gonna it's really crazy we're gonna rent out a house for three days i'm gonna rent it out uh in the suburbs of chicago and get local actors and it's gonna be like a, a party basically uh not going yeah. overboard we all have to perform our jobs well but you know you know you gotta loosen up when you're with a lot of people people and you know have a drink or two or whatever loosen up and then uh everybody's gonna be doing yeah yeah don't give them too much or nothing will get done exactly you get no no hard yeah. liquor allowed no wine allowed just if you need some a couple beers or whatever to loosen up and go for it you know so you really want to get a lot of shit done cocaine only <laughs> nah no hard <laughs> drugs allowed that shit will just mess with people's uh, air conditioner getting loud get that off yeah it's uh you know, you can't be messing with no hard drugs. That's one thing that I have always lived by, despite being in chronic pain. I've never turned to heroin once because I knew it would be the end to, the end of me. Okay, yeah, that's been the end for a lot of people. Yeah, with people with no problems in life. They're living good lives, you know, and a lot of them have been my friends. It's like, why do you have to do that? Like, I'm struggling my ass off with chronic pain for so many years, and the doctors wouldn't even give me medication to help because I just look like look a uh, young druggie or something. And yet, I pulled it together. I graduate college, and you know, it's a, it's about willpower. It's just everybody has to find that thing within and just push on, and you know, do what matters to you. And that's what this comedy project is to me. So, yeah, and find uh, strategies that are uh, help uh, them to get to a place where they can find help if you're struggling with something, and um, figure out that not everyone um, is going to work the same way. Everyone has unique um way of thinking and reaction to things yeah. you know it could be on the autism spectrum you could have asperger's you could have adhd um you could have a variety of things i learned recently that adhd is one um is responds really well to medication yeah, and yeah. um That's compared to like depression yeah depression only like 30 percent of people respond well to medication but for adhd like 75 percent of people respond well to medication wow um so i guess if there's anything if you think you might have adhd it's worth getting that looked at and maybe get tested or uh something i found useful advice was um talk to other people who have a condition and see if you relate to them and see if um yeah uh, uh, uh you know that resonates with you like you could talk to people who have adhd or talk to people who maybe have asperger's 
and um, see if that's kind of a similar experience. Um, and, uh, you know, I would like to talk to some people who um, maybe have uh, like some form of Asperger's and um, also ADHD and uh, see if uh, I see any similarities. And um, I could I could see if uh, if I did have uh, some mild have it? ADHD. It's I'm thinking hmm. a little more on the autism side than ADHD, but it's possible to have both. Yeah. And if that was the case, maybe I would respond really well to like a low dose, slow release, um, hmm. um, like type of medication for ADHD, which is like, which uh, instead of in a, a regular person makes them more agitated and more hyper and ADHD person makes you slightly more relaxed and easier to focus. Isn't it the uppers? Or, like the, the thing that people, students take drugs that are uppers, but in ADHD yes. people, it relaxes them and calms them down. What yeah, and a, uh, that drug, the main one. The, there's uh, Ritalin, I yeah, think, Ritalin. is one of them. Yeah, Ritalin. Is um, I was thinking. Adderall, I yeah, believe. Yeah. I, uh, there's sure. there's a there's a bunch of different uh, brand names I found out. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I never had any of that. Um, I know people uh, took it in school. I didn't really know any of those people who did. I never had and, it that probably would have been helpful for someone like me who leaves things to the last minute. And that was easier in, um, in like primary school and high school where I kind of was able to coast cause I was pretty smart. So without <laughs> like a lot of prep, I was able to kind of coast and do preparation last minute and kind of just do True. well on tests. But it's like when things to become more, uh, less structured and more longer time scale where you have to, it's impossible to do everything you need to do. And it's like the last night when panic finally sets in and you realize yeah. there's, there's no more time that you can procrastinate. That's like, uh, yeah. and also, uh, uh, I know I've like that. found that's a common thing with procrastinators. I, it helps to... Maybe some of there's a thing between procrastination, and ADHD, but, um, so, um, there's some people that I know in college that were like that, or like even washing dishes or like something like that. They'll put it off to the last minute or uh you or know. washing dishes could suddenly become a good thing to do when you have to do something else <laughs> you know it's like yeah. oh well i gotta write this uh, essay and this is the last night to do it but let me go ahead and clean my house and wash the <laughs> floors and vacuum and clean the dishes and you yeah. know all these other things <laughs> because <laughs> that'll let me and like and you don't if if you don't have like if you're like a procrastinator like it's very hard without like some form of panic setting in like that's that's a band-aid solution is like if you have a a panic that's in from a deadline mm -hmm. or um um or maybe if uh yeah because you know the right way is to do things little by little but so that's that's a way people with like uh, adhd um they can um, have troubles later in life even though they're um yeah. could seem very gifted early in sure. life um because that that the the focus is all over and uh you want to really um be able to focus on one thing uh and um suddenly make progress slowly over time uh in sure. one area all right how about we mix it up a little bit we've been talking about this for a while uh, back to world war one thing because i've been listening to the hardcore history podcast for world war one i've listened to it through, uh, this might be my third or fourth time listening it's incredible but you, you there's so many details you forget them so this is fresh now so and the uh, uh, the armies learned that uh, you had to rotate the troops away from the front because people who were left there for too long, they would go out of their minds, like literally. They would call it shell shock because they thought that it was the artillery shells that were landing near them and maybe causing some kind of uh, physical uh, brain damage or whatever. But then they learned it was actually uh, psychological more, and it really ties into the mind-body connection. Some people, without any physical damage whatsoever, they were getting blind. Blinded. They were not able to visually see anything without any physical damage whatsoever. Yeah, if you watch uh, Band of Brothers, they had a good episode on that. Oh, I've seen it all. That I've HBO that series. One. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, there's a guy who um, gets, uh, he was in a foxhole and... Uh, he got this blind, hysterical blindness, I think wow. they called it, yeah, and uh, it, 
uh, you know, there was like this feeling that like he was letting everyone else down, yeah, that he yeah. couldn't uh, continue. Oh, yeah. Like he, uh, I remember that now. Were they in, like, so he had this intense in a, shame. Were they in a barn in that scene or something. Like it progressed to a barn. I yeah, mean. Okay. Uh, that's where something unfortunate happened. All right, yeah, let's not say too much. <laughs> when All he right. wanted to take the lead later on, he suddenly he felt better. It went away, and uh, then the war happens as war happens. Of course. <laughs> so, anyways, the, the uh, people on the front lines they have no access to a body of water all the time to have food to have water i mean to drink and all that stuff so it was up to the people in the back to bring forth the supplies needed to survive on the front but the artillery shells from the enemy are crashing in killing all your supply guys so next thing you know you're about to they're smart that's what they aim for yeah, yeah the enemy. so uh, so these guys who are uh, finding cover uh, these artillery shells when they blow up they would leave gigantic craters and i just looked at an image of the uh, verdun battle site now you can pull up images on youtube right now it looks like a foreign alien land because the the ground is so deformed from millions of shells landing right there and blowing pounds and pounds of dirt in, into the air and stuff so get this they had artillery shells that actually had poison gas in them and so they had three different types the one was just the most yeah. destructive you had another yeah. one in the middle and then you had the poison ones so this you got poison everywhere you got rain coming down into these uh, craters so these guys are taking cover in the craters they're they're dehydrated as hell they need water no matter what so they're drinking water out of desperation where you got bodies blood uh, who knows what kind of bacteria poison and they're forced to drink this crap because their supply people were not able to basically get water. basically flint michigan tap water <laughs> yeah pretty much and it's it's which is pretty better, shitty right? so yeah i feel bad for them yeah yeah and uh flint michigan might be a little bit worse and i gotta get into the stormtroopers uh, the germans had this elite squad where after they bombard an area uh, with a insane number like hundreds of thousands of artillery uh shells uh, landing in a spot the stormtroopers would go in but they would have gas masks on because of all the the gas that was in the air and then they would be on horses and they would, <laughs> there's a really awesome staff which is going to uh, a picture i mean which is going to be the thumbnail for this video where this guy has a staff he's wearing like a gas mask on a horse it looks like uh, sci-fi mixed with history all in one image it's so ridiculous. Was there a practical, was that a real thing that they carried? Some kind of lance or staff? Yeah, not every single one. Uh, they they were known for their melee weapons because what they're doing is there's a lot of uh, enemies who are hiding in their, you know, their trenches or their little fortresses. So they can get up close uh, yeah, with they, they, poor visibility to people to use. Yeah, uh, and especially if you have limited ammo, you can't carry everything on you and so they were If gas for, is going, if clouds of gas are there, you could get right up to someone before they know it. Yeah, but the gas would be knocking people on the ground. There's there's a story of people getting exposed to gas where they're literally choking. If you don't have a mask on, you literally choke on the spot. People are having seizures. You have people with red foam shooting out of their mouth as they're twitching on the floor. It, that's how hardcore this gas was. And, so, and shitting themselves and dying instantly. Yeah, I'm sure that happened too. A and lot of so, people, if you die instantly, you shit yourself right away. Hmm. You ever hear the death rattle? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah, the last thing these people do uh, when you die is you have a rattle that happens for some reason, somehow. I have no idea. I saw a video of a horse being killed not too long ago. Um, it was um, hmm. where they, uh, and it was, he had, uh, well, he had um, um, a mare in heat, where, uh, and then it makes the stallion all horny. So, uh, <laughs> but the mare is all like, doesn't want to be mounted, doesn't want to be banged. So she's like kicking and like being crazy, and the stallion's all excited and is like he has he's hard just like and ducks. he's fully erect and he's like rrr, rrr, wants to go at it. <laughs> so then in the video, it's like some Mexican guys, a guy's yeah. filming, and he's like, there's like some Coronas are like drinking beers, like oh, uh -huh. no, and like and then the mare is going in a circle like kicking, and then as it gets close, it kicks with its back feet right, right in, in like the forehead of the of the of the stallion, uh. and immediately it falls over starts farting and shitting Ugh. like just non-stop shitting Where and it's like and it's like this like it's seizing up as it's shitting 
uh, horrible. And then it's like just slowly like where do you come across a like this? <laughs> Reddit. <laughs> Reddit. Is... <laughs> of course. Oh, uh, I forget which subreddit it was. I've joined some interesting yeah, ones recently. I don't, I don't watch. There's it. one called. Um, it's not like Everett. it doesn't. Sh- I'm not in the one with like people being killed anymore because that's too depressing. Yeah, that's but uh, it does show stuff like that. I think it might be. Uh, there's a couple I joined recently. One is oddly terrifying. Has some good things, just weird stuff that freaks people out. A um, couple good ones I joined recently. I forget which one that was in though. Oh, here. Let me speak, speaking of all these hardcore, like depressing stuff, the Aussies yeah. in World War One still. Depression. We're sticking with World War One. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, he's having a seizure of some kind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Core depression. The uh, Aussies and the New Zealanders uh, in World War One had the reputation of being the most hardcore out of any of the uh, soldiers because uh, they had like even gallows humor. They were incredible warriors, but in order to cope with the suffering on the you know war front, they uh, you know had like the most ridiculous, like wild sense of humor too, like joking about dead bodies. So. They talk about how they would bury the dead bodies. You're talking hundreds of thousands of dead. Uh, in World War One alone, you had 40 million dead on both sides. So you're talking hundreds of thousands of bodies, like for any given unit. And uh, these bodies are on the same uh, front because the fronts were not moving. They were right along the trenches. Unlike World War Two, where the fronts would be moving and you're not sitting around near all these dead bodies. But these Aussies had to be around these dead bodies all the time, and they were burying them. And they had a, a they noticed that uh, hands for whatever reason would pop out of the soil and so with this one hand popped out of the soil and the Aussies every day they would shake the hand and say oh hello and they would shake the dead hand <laughs> and it was like one after another just yeah. to keep themselves like how, sane. how polite I mean it sounds crazy now but imagine how insane you're gonna get if you're in the war <laughs> this is this is the funny. first time look in, in the Napoleon era like if a battle lasted three days that's like a forever i mean we're talking year after year after year of battle in world war one it was the most horrific thing anything anybody could ever go through uh considering human history so you got something okay. you to bring up yeah uh since uh you were talking about all this war stuff i found a good speech i came across this has been going across reddit recently and this is from a uh, veteran i'm going to try to do a, a screen share on this um um find the right here we are i'll make it big all right it went away you, you... did i did i kill it or yeah i was just about to click it and then it's gone oh because i moved it i gotta do it again yeah okay all right hit it again now it says watch stream Okay, it's up. You got it? All right. I'm going to hit play on it. So this is from a veteran who, um, I think they went to D.C. to do, uh, to protest a bit. And um, he's just a veteran who's kind of uh, had, uh, uh, he's uh, articulate and he put it together a nice little speech about his experiences in war. So let's have a quick listen to this. If I uh, raise the volume. The Marines and the Air Force and the Navy. Do you hear that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's start, start from the beginning. beginning. It's a little faint, but it's we are here. We're here to say to all those serving in the Army and the Marines and the Air Force and the Navy that you have the absolute right to refuse to take part in these criminal wars, and that's the right that all of you should exercise. You have no reason to go put your life on the line or kill and die for profit. We've been to Iraq. We've been to Afghanistan. And we know what these wars are really about. And we joined the military for many reasons. Because we need a college education. Because we need a job. Because we need health care. And then we joined the military. And they tell us that our enemies are poor people in caves in Afghanistan. Or poor people in deserts of Iraq. But we've been to those countries. And we know that our enemies are not other poor people abroad. Our enemies are the people that laid us off from our jobs. That denied us health care. That make it impossible to get an education. Our enemies are not in the poor on the planet, but right here in the richest one. The occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan alone are costing over $700 million every single day. This is a crime every single day while so many of us are hurting. Well, I think all of us here and the vast majority of people 
veteran suicides. Would agree that we can spend seven hundred million dollars a day better than bombing people that we have no reason to bomb. We can spend seven hundred million dollars a day rebuilding those countries we've destroyed. We can spend seven hundred million dollars a day caring for the veterans we get home when they get home, and then we can spend seven hundred million dollars a day giving every single person health care, a college education, a job. the money in that way they're not going to end the wars and they're not going to do it because it's not our government it's their government it's the government of the rich it's the government of wall street True. of the oil giants of the defense contractors it's their government and the only language that they understand is shutting down business as usual and that's what we're doing here today and we're going to continue to do until the it's crystal clear now that these wars are going to continue and expand and go into other countries. That is the trend. That is what we know that there is perpetual war and it's only going to stop if the people True. stand up and stop it. And that's what we're going to do, sisters and brothers. A lot of people ask me, what do we do? Because we all know things are bad. We all see the atrocities on TV. We read about it. We experience it. People always ask, what do I do? Because we always want to know what to do. Do we vote? support a politician uh what, yeah, bernie you know, sanders an organization what mm -hmm. do we do well i'll tell you what we do it's simple we fight we fight and we fight and we fight and we shut down our workplaces we shut down our schools we shut down the streets we shut down business as usual and we fight until we force the people in there to do what the people out here want because that's how we're going to get around and we're going to fight until there's not one more bomb drop not one more bullet fired not one more bomb You know, pretty sure that guy got arrested 15, shortly 000. after that, Get probably this. because he was too persuasive. In Russia, 15,000 or more people are now in jail. Uh, close that thing out so we can make ourselves big again, too. Uh, oh, wait, here, I got it, I think. Yeah, so in Russia right now, over 15,000 people, probably even more now, are in jail for opposing that. And what you just showed, uh, I saw that in person at the, I think it was the was it G8 or G10, whatever it was, uh, in Chicago. Me and my brother and a friend of ours, we were there live on scene at the scene of the protests where there was a ton of veterans on a stage just outside the uh, uh, the mccormick's place is where it was happening and we were on the streets and uh they were ripping their medals off of their shirts and throwing them towards the building saying you know we're dying for this pieces of tin on our chests and they were throwing it and they were really raising awareness for veteran uh mental health because there's like i forget the exact statistics but many many it was something like oh at least 10 or more uh veterans kill themselves every single day and so yeah yeah, we got to look up the exact uh, stats, so don't take my word for it. I, I think that was really well said by that guy, and that resonated with me. And um, I think, uh, yeah, it is hard uh, because voting is uh, not very effective with uh, the way our government is set up right now. Sure. Um, no matter which party you vote for, um, it still leads to the money in the end. Yeah. So uh, if we really uh, want a better system... It seems that the only way it would be, um, it's hard to get everyone on board with this, but would be mass strikes to the point where mm -hmm. the entire economy would be shut down and it would have to be costing, you know, yeah. billions of dollars a day. Basically, the entire country would just have to, every business, every school, nothing would be able to function mm. if there was just a unified mass strike. And uh, and we would others may pounce on us when in our time of weakness though you know what I mean like if our country gets really really weak and even if the military is not doing their jobs what stops another military like from doing whatever they want to us at that point you know that's the tricky part. That's uh, I think that's almost sounds like some kind of scare, scare tactic kind of uh, idea to like put into it uh, that uh, the military. Um, 
Yeah, you know, I don't know if you can convince everyone in the military to also strike along with everything else. I think the military would be one body where they're so reliant on the government and they're so kind of, and if you know people in the military, they tend to believe it more. They tend yeah. to be more indoctrinated. They're kind of broken down oh, they are. Uh, okay. what, during training and then they're able to be remolded. So they're more, you know, uh, effective at uh, a tool. I know many and um, yeah, and a lot of well meaning people. And sometimes they don't really, it takes like going to a war and then, seen the those type of things and having before your eyes really open up to it or or you can just be kind of fatalistic and think uh, you know this is the way it is but uh yeah i think if everyone if everything shut down and it would be tough um because the military and the police would probably be mobilized to start uh, attacking people and killing them and putting them in prison to try to end it because that that would yeah. uh uh, it will be tough, but um, maybe if that happened, then we could uh, we could get something more similar to a direct democracy, where it's less of a representative because we're in a representative democracy. Yeah. If you're in a direct democracy where legislation was like you know only very simple, easy to understand, only instead of hundreds of pages long, you know, just a couple of pages not written by lawyers, everyone could vote on yeah, Elon everything that, important. Right? That yeah, that's uh, one of his yeah. ideas. For for, uh, Mars. If there's going to be a government on Mars, maybe yeah. the way it can function. But at least, you know, at least like a parliamentary system or a system with multiple parties where uh, the system was set up so that the voting wasn't locked into two parties. That's yeah. working out a lot better for other countries. Like I just saw in Australia, <laughs> they had just had historic wins in the Labor Party. Uh, the Conservative Party lost out big time. And the uh, Labor Party, Green Party, and uh, something like the Teal, something, independents, like, because they said the last independents weren't real independents. They wanted centrists, but they were just voting with conservatives all the time. So, did, so they just had a landslide basically to the left in Australia. Okay, that's a mainstream which, left party that won, though, right? Yeah, yeah. It's basically like uh, the Labor Party, uh, yeah, like basically. England. Um, yeah, that sounds about right. You know, stuff, yeah. a party that would get you, like, universal health care and, you oh, know, some that, maybe better uh, benefits by default instead of like, on a company-by-company company basis. Yeah. And especially towards, like, uh, energy, clean energy, healthier forms of producing energy that don't spew all these, you know, causing cancer and everyone around there and lung disease and heart attacks and just stick it in poor neighborhoods and black neighborhoods yeah. and have them drink, you know, lead water and yeah, uh, et cetera, et cetera. About uh, Winston Churchill, <clears throat> after he uh, helped, you know, win the war against Nazi Germany, you would think he was considered a national hero, but he was more of a conservative. He got voted out right after he defeated the freaking Nazis. What do you have to do if you're so some because the people were in such desperate straits that they yeah. needed more uh, government support? And if he's a conservative, they're not going to want to like get less help. Well, I need help. I'm going to vote for help. And maybe help. maybe he was the perfect maybe he was the perfect leader for the war, but he was the wrong leader for the recovery. Yeah, that's possible too. Where people are just built built where they're better at certain things and. If he's, if you're good at being a ruthless uh, general <laughs> who is able to effectively yeah. destroy your enemies and be clever and see through, you know, deceptions and set up your own deceptions and <laughs> set up <laughs> intelligence services, that doesn't necessarily transfer. The same skills might not be good in helping your own people, you know. Yeah, but get this: in World War One, he was actually a big failure. He was in charge of the Navy, and in World War One, they were leading this attack on the Dart. Dardanelles by Turkey because it was an important waterway. Long story short, Churchill's plan got altered and screwed up big time, and he was fired from his position. And at that point in World War One, he thought his career was over, and he was miserable about it. You could read what he wrote about it at the time, and so it was one of the great comeback stories for a guy like that to be able to become the leader of England for World War Two. So that's a really fascinating guy. The biggest com comeback story ever is definitely Napoleon when he uh, 
I think I talked about this already in a different podcast, so I don't want to repeat myself. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. yeah. About the Napoleon thing. Uh, well, I don't know. I hope we get somewhere with some changes because this two-party system and the uh, captured by uh, big money is really not doing good for us. It's really, it seems to be getting worse. And I don't see an end in sight right now. Like, yeah. progressives think that, oh, we'll just keep, uh, you know, getting in progressives and they'll change the Democratic Party. <laughs> and uh, so far, it hasn't worked at all. It's just been the Dividing mainstream the is just, yeah, like, they've, uh, they haven't been able to get anything they wanted. Biden, if you look at his agenda, is, hasn't gotten anything done. Like they were voting. supposed to do some type voting. of universal health care. They were supposed to lower the cost of Medicare. They were lower, supposed to lower the cost of prescription drugs. They were supposed to lower student debt. I looked at a, star, a chart of uh, debt per person, like what their highest debt was. And in the last eight years, uh, it used to be um, uh, student debt and car debt have skyrocketed, <laughs> where they used to be the lowest forms of debt. And now they're the the two highest forms of debt interesting like I, i'm not even gonna vote this time because uh like honestly the democrats are better for my personal life situation but yeah it's just i don't know it just seems like you're gonna get screwed one way or another or you're gonna it's just the degrees it's just the degrees of how badly you get screwed so <laughs> yeah. with republicans you tend to get screwed a bit more and then the democrats you tend to be screwed a bit less and it's also which special interests you like better. So if you like the uh, big oil special interests, you like the energy companies, if you like um, the uh, the religious uh, nutsos, then you go more on the Republican. If you like uh, more like unions, some of which are shitty and corrupt, some of which are good, and you like maybe like trial lawyers and like a bunch of like high powered like elitist type people who are kind of have some liberal viewpoints but are also making sure that they're still looking out for themselves <laughs> more than poor people then that's the democrat side speaking, speaking of the religious thing or and, and, and not even religious i just saw a video by chance the other night uh, there's a guy from england who's got a pretty big youtube channel he goes around like pranking like people he doesn't like and they're mostly on the right and, and racist and stuff so he went to what was supposed to be the most racist he did a big city. prank with a car one time i'm not that familiar with him though i'm not sure okay. but he lives in england and so he came to the united states and to go to the most he's a, a black guy who lives in england oh boy yeah so he came to the united states to <laughs> probably had a home. worse welcome <laughs> over the u.s bad worse reactions well no the whole point was to go to the most racist uh city oh, sure. in the entire as long country. as he doesn't get shot and he went to this place it was in Arkansas. I forget the name of the city off the top of my head, but it turns <laughs> nice. out that the leader of the KKK lives there. And mm. then so he shows up, he finds some meets some people. Everybody was real nice to him there. So the city wasn't racist. But uh he got a guy to show like they figured out where the leader of the KKK lived. And <laughs> this guy from England rolls up to this guy's door and just like says, Yeah, hi, I'm from the BBC. Just like lying completely. He's not even from the BBC. And then this KKK guy is like, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not now give me a call tomorrow and maybe we'll get it done so then the kkk guy and him talk the next day and then they meet to uh, have a meeting in the uh, arrange to meet to meet in a church right next to the guy's house and then so they do this legit interview and the guy's just trolling him the entire time he's just troll and this video is like pretty new and he's got like over 10 million views or something like that and he just oh. keeps trolling the guy over and over did he again. like did he promise the kkk guy money for the interview no, but the guy did not, the KKK guy did not even do any research into who this guy was, and he just he thought he was going to get a lot of exposure from the BBC. Well, the, the guy, uh, the prankster, he said that he was actually uh, uh, doing a positive in interview on the KKK and why they're not racist. 
<laughs> so he thought oh, he was going to okay. get positive exposure. Yeah. And he made right. up some organization. And he put up like a social media page. And it's just he trolls him over Easy and over. And, and yeah. he had no idea uh, of, of that he was getting trolled until the very end when the guy's leaving the church. And he's like, uh, he said something like, do you ever have uh, sex in the KKK hood? And <laughs> the guy realized he was mm-hmm. ranked at that point. And then he uh, took off. And it sounds like something you and me would say on like a calling in on a public access show. <laughs> we used to go back in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was some of the best laughs possible. <laughs> yeah, it reminded me almost word for word of like something you said. Like uh, we were calling up a show, and it was some guy who was like talking about his experiences being homosexual and the the problems with it. And he was calling up a church, and then I think you had a question for him was like. Uh, the whole you were like pretend to be good like you got to pretend like you have a good question so they get you on air so then <laughs> you can have a real question to get you on air but then as soon as they put you on air you just <laughs> you just say something on it totally random you're like i understand he's a homosexual but is he a flaming homosexual i think is what you said <laughs> and they're and like you probably could have went longer with that, but I think you started laughing to cut us off right away. I don't remember fully. I I, I kind of I know we used to do a lot of prank calls back in the. It was like we we're kids, so don't judge me, guys. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, I it was like from our uh, you know our families too, and like older people and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I never had anything against anyone being gay. No, or, I'm fine with you it. know. I've, I've yeah. had gay friends. They're cool. I, I, want, I wish nothing but the best for them. You know that. And I want equality for them and everything. So, yeah, <laughs> we used to do a lot. Oh man, my my. Cream. You uh, you or one of yours was uh, you? We look up people in the phone books and uh, just like a company at, uh, for some company and just make up something stupid uh, <laughs> like, the, like involving their product and just call them up. Usually yeah. something sexual, you know, involving oh, their I product, was, like a fence company. You, do you no, remember no, no, that I one? Like the, the best one was uh, I was I was practicing for prom night and it, come, right. it got stuck in the pipe. <laughs> yeah. That was a hilarious and, was, point. and the guy's like trying to... And like, we did like an Indian voice. I think we're doing an Indian voice. Yeah, we're like, it up, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, I was practicing for a prom night, and every, so everything would go swell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still remember that swell. <laughs> and then it got stuck in the fucking bathtub. <laughs> and then my mother tried to wash vegetables downstairs, and semen <laughs> came out. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, those prank calls were the best. I used to show up. I remember we people. found a restaurant uh, that we kept calling the same restaurant. Barnaby's. Was it Barnaby's? Yeah. Basically, they called the no, same no, restaurant don't say like that multiple story. That's times. That's too much. <laughs> many times. Yeah, the guy was into it, but he was like, yeah, you know, my the, manager's getting sick of this stuff. Yeah. You know, he's, the, the, the manager. They're going to call the cops. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to stop. He was gonna, we did. We called him like ten times, like every weekend or more or something like that. That was. Hilarious. I think that was before caller ID was a thing. Uh, we, or, uh, had all, all we had to do was star sixty nine or star sixty seven. Oh yeah, that blocked your number. Previous caller. Star oh yeah. And then the other thing we used to do is, is that still a thing now. Could you still yeah. do star six seven? Oh okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. The other thing we used to do was uh, nowadays probably kids to be smart they like use like a Google phone or like a Skype through like a VPN or something like that uh, a pay phone uh you're able to there's a special oh, yeah those thing. don't exist anymore yeah, back in the day when there was pay phones there was like a special number you would type in and it would get the call the pay phone to call itself so every time we find hmm. a pay phone we just hit the code <laughs> i just <laughs> walk away <laughs> yeah <laughs> just watch to see who to answer it oh man like there were so many crazy times as a kid like my favorite was uh i don't want to say any names but this uh most wild kid in the neighborhood uh we we went into this video store and he was like whoa 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 like acting like he lost control of his body he was knocking all oh, yeah. videos all over that the floor <laughs> he was knocking videos all over the floor and then this is the store owners like chasing and back them. when there were actual video stores yeah, yeah. VHSs and and stuff yep. yeah <laughs> oh man too many crazy childhood stories like back when things used to be fun and not everything on camera so if you make a mistake it's with you for life there's plenty of mistakes that everybody's made but unfortunately nowadays the kids have to be as preserved as possible otherwise their lives are screwed 
<laughs> yeah, I wonder if that is having the kind of a there is that self censorship yeah. effect is going on. People are committing suicide over the pressures of social media and being bullied mm-hmm. when you're at the comfort of your home. It's a epidemic of young girls. And th- there was that movie yeah. from uh, used Netflix. to be able to get away from it. You know, at yeah. least it ended. What was that uh, Netflix one about uh, the documentary about how Facebook is really bad and social media is horrible on mental health? Uh, I forget the name of it, but I watched it. And, yeah, it's a very good one, and uh, it, it points out the suicide rate of kids in their like ten year olds, twelve year olds, and just, and even yeah, a little it's bit older. Skyrocketed. Yeah, oh, it's yeah. much higher than it used to be. And psychologists know a hundred percent social media like is not tripled healthy. or more. Oh, it's yeah. ridiculous. Like they showed a chart. It's I think it's way more than even tripled. It's been like it was like a straight line up when social media was created. It was messed up. So yeah, you got to and also a lot of these big tech people, they don't even allow their kids to use social media or computers. Yeah, they know how bad it could be. Yeah, yeah, like Bill Gates I think was one of them. Uh there's a bunch of other big names too. Although the single player games are fine cuz yeah. uh that doesn't cause any issues like that. And uh I saw a study that uh playing video games is uh despite some panic in the early days that's yeah. going to make you dumb and addicted and was uh, that it can increase your intelligence because you're uh yeah. stimulating your brain with active problem solving exactly. versus more passive things like watching television. And it builds coordination, hand eye coordination. Like that's why I yeah. like playing Halo on the hardest. When you day. play a video game, yeah, you got you. It's that you got to figure out a whole new system. As Strategy. every game has its own system. Strategy. There's some carryover from like different genres, but like uh, you know, you for, got to switch from one to the other. Understand how that works. Understand how to be successful in that system. And, and um, yeah, learn new buttons for each action. Yeah, learn new right. strategies. You try, fail, try again, fail a different way, try, and then eventually you're going to succeed. Especially when you're playing it at the level that you're meant to play it on. The, so, like, I'm uh, I've always been really good at first person shooters, so I, I like to play it on the hardest difficulty. And I fail over and over and over and over again, and then finally, yeah, legendary on Halo, oh, yeah, it'll definitely, will yeah, happen a lot. Especially if you play Elden Ring, get ready for that and, and the thing with Elden Ring there's no difficulty level you can't change it so it's on basically on legendary ultra hard by default what about the other one? I don't even know. I think, uh, I don't know if enemies scale, but it seems like they're always hard no matter what. Even if you go grind and power level, you can still get wrecked. What about Unless Bloodborne? you have this right build. Is it harder than Bloodborne? Bloodborne I, was too I, hard. It wasn't even fun to me. I think so. Uh, it's it's that company. If you look at the previous games they've done. Um, it's the same company? They're, they're all hard. Um, I don't know. If they're, they're the Dark Souls games oh, or, Dark, or what they yeah, did. That's what I meant. Dark Souls, not Bloodborne. Or is Bloodborne mm-hmm. one of them? I don't even know. I forget. It's kind of a similar vein, I think, where it is one of those really challenging, kind of dodgy games. Or it's just like so open-ended in the builds that like... Some like uh, I found one build where it was like a uh, berserk style build, and it ba- they actually have the 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 berserk gut sword in the game. Nice. It's called a great sword. It's cool. Yeah, it's a they, it's a direct reference, like you know, Easter egg to people are fans of berserk. You're talking about an yeah. anime named berserk, or uh, and the main guy's name is guts in there. Yeah, it's written by uh, Kentaro Miura. He died uh, recently, mm-hmm. last uh, year or so. It was a massive and um, probably the yeah. best one ever, right? Would you still say it's the best ever? I love it. It's definitely my top ten easily. Uh, there's I mean, so much good and manga probably. and anime out there. Yeah. Um, so I, I saw that. So I got into that build and I grinded and did everything and and I but it didn't put that much time, but. The, not, it's a really beautiful game like the amount of variability in the environments is and the beauty of them is great like just walking around except there's like everything will kill you in two hits as you're walking around <laughs> But uh, so I like grinded. I looked up these guides. Then you do that, but then you might not like the play style. So once I I, I like the idea of it, but in the anime, uh, he was super. Even though he had that gigantic sword, he was super fast. It was yeah. like he was having a regular oh, yeah. size sword with a speed. In the game, no, it's very fucking slow. 
So yeah, it does a lot of damage, but everything in that game does way more damage than you no matter what. So the fact that you are you do an attack and it's like a full one or two seconds, you're unable to do anything, you're gonna get counterattacked a hundred percent. So like it became like the like a terrible, brutal play style where no matter what I did, even though I had this, it did a lot of damage. But if you don't kill things in one hit, then you're dead. Yeah. So there's a, the boss is no way they die in one hit. So one strategy was like um, just jump and attack. So like a lot of the whole thing is jump and attack and then run away and like roll away. Is that, is that and I was like, I hate attack? that play style. Is that a faster it's just, attack or what is it? No, you well it's not. Well, well, because you start from a distance, like they tend, the enemy tends not to attack until it gets closer. Depending on what ah. every every enemy has, like it, there's no like easy pattern. They have like 20 patterns each, and they're all crazy cool. complex and fast. And I guess some people do memorize them, but I'm like, I want to put that fucking yeah, research like, into each one like this. Better. Yeah, God of War is way easier than uh, that I was gonna game. Say, My God, uh, I saw a pro gamer. <clears throat> he was uh, playing uh, Elder Ring, uh, Elden Ring, and uh, normally he's really good in all his games. He's got like I forget which guy it was, but he's like got millions and millions of fans. And then like getting destroyed. Yeah, he was playing it, and then he got hit a few times, and he knew that failure was inevitable. And so we just rage quit real quick, and tried to act like he was calm and cool and collected. <laughs> and, then, and then he was, <laughs> and then he. He was like, yeah, I'm done playing this game, huh? And he was like trying to hide the rage, but he was so mad. He was so mad. It was hilarious. It becomes passive aggressive. Yeah. You're trying to hide it, but like you say normal things, but everything is laced with an intensity of a yeah. thousand burning suns. Uh, yeah, and then he had he like had to leave the computer for a little bit right away afterwards, and I stopped watching. It was just a hilarious moment. It was a viral moment. That's why it was being shared so much. So, uh, what time is it? Well, it's already 111 here. Maybe we should wrap this up. Yeah, sounds good. All right. I've been forgetting to close this out with Memento Mori. Remember, you shall die, so make the most of your life every day, every minute. And, uh, yeah, if you guys want more of this kind of content, you know, subscribe, share it with your friends. But also know that this comedy show is the reason I haven't been putting out any more visual videos lately. I've been putting all my effort into this. And that's going to be bigger than any philosophy show is uh, possible to i mean philosophy youtube channel because not everybody wants cold hard truths because they're uncomfortable but everybody wants to laugh and everybody wants to have sex not that there's sex in my comedy show but <laughs> that's about it so memento mori and you got anything to say go to musings by marco channel as well yeah and uh i don't have any other videos recently because I am distracted by a million different things all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I would like to do some more videos about Tesla. See, I don't know if I want to do videos about finance, about the Tesla, about just random things every day. But I can't do tech reviews all the time because I don't have the products. I don't have the money to recycle that stuff. Get them from Best That's what I started return with. Them, return them. Yeah, <laughs> some people literally do do that. But uh, I don't want to do that. It's too much hassle, and I feel like a scumbag. Got to go so, to different stores so you're less of a scumbag in their eyes, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, good talking as usual. Too, and uh, it's been a good time. Yeah. So, all right, Momento more, guys. Week.